Hey guys, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. When I'm doing a building, something like my Hags Hut, I sometimes get a little annoyed when I have to stop, get out of the zone to make something like a door or a window. I just wanna make the building, not the thing that goes on the building. And I've always thought it would be a good idea to pre-make a bunch of things like doors in bulk so they're on hand and ready to go when I need them. This week, I finally decided to get that off my to-do list and I made a bunch of resin doors so I have them on hand and ready to go. I am going to be using what some might consider to be advanced materials and techniques. I'm gonna be sculpting a master door out of green stuff, then I'm going to be making a silicone mold and then casting duplicates in resin. Now, if you're not interested in getting into mold making and casting, if that's too intimidating, that's okay. I think the takeaway of this video is just the idea of pre-making a bunch of an item with whatever material you feel the most comfortable with. But if you are thinking about getting into mold making and casting, well, this is a great introduction to that. As in reality, mold making, like one part mold, is really simple. It's not something you should be afraid of, and you'll see just how easy it actually is. Now, I am by no means an expert when it comes to mold making and casting resin, but several months ago, some of you may remember that I entertained the idea of creating modular dungeon doors with removable magnetic door slabs, molding them, casting them in resin, and selling them. I was thinking about getting into that business as a way to kind of spark the income for this channel. So I spent a good solid week just learning how to cast, sculpting, doing resin, all sorts of stuff, and I got a fairly good handle on it. And actually, those doors turned out pretty darn good. The only reason I didn't proceed with that project is because I realized that it would be successful. And if it's successful, that would have meant I would have been casting resin almost full time, which would have been really counterintuitive to my main goal, which was to find a way to make this channel more and more successful. So I actually decided not to do that, but I did learn a lot about those materials in the process. So instead of entering that market today, I'm just gonna share with you what I learned and how to do it and how to get started yourself. So with that out of the way, let's make some doors in bulk. To start, I needed to sculpt a master door. This wouldn't actually require much tooling or material to do, and most of the time and effort was really spent just getting a sculpt that I would be happy with to use over and over again. I used green stuff to make my master, but any epoxy putty would work, and in retrospect, milliput actually would have been a better choice as it's softer and easier to work with. In fact, you could technically make a master out of any putty or clay, even something like plasticine. It doesn't need to be something that will cure and harden. It just needs to last long enough to make the mold. I personally do like the idea, however, of using a material that will give me a permanent master sculpt, but not for any real reason, as I could technically just save the first resin cast as a new master to make more molds of in the future. Once my green stuff was mixed, I rolled it out flat using a plain rolling pin from Green Stuff World and a bit of Sculptor's Vaseline to prevent sticking. To get the basic shape of the door slab, I used this template from ShiftingLands.com. This really is not its intended use, but it works great for this sort of thing. I applied some of the Vaseline to the edge of the template so that the putty didn't stick, then worked the putty into the template, removed it, and cut off the excess. I then put the template back on to ensure the slab held its shape while doing the wood sculpting. For the sculpt, I started by segmenting the slab into four planks by carving in deep grooves. Then using a combination of a sharp pointed sculpting tool and an X-Acto knife, I created the wood grain texture, one line at a time, also adding in a few round spots to look like knots. The nice thing about doing a master and casting it is that you can spend so much more time on the little details than if you had to sculpt a whole bunch of these individually.
I then created a door handle. First, I rolled out a very thin piece of green stuff and cut it into a square to act as sort of an iron plate for the handle. Then for the actual door handle itself, I used my go-to jewelry ring. And like I've said before, I've never been able to find something just like these online to link to. I was just fortunate enough to find them in person at Michael's. So sorry, I can't give you an exact link. I simply pressed the jumper ring into the putty until the ring was sitting tight against it. This door handle assembly could then be attached to the slab with a little bit of super glue. I found that there seems to be no ill effect using super glue to bond uncured green stuff to itself. I wanted the door to have two metal hinges, so I went about sculpting those in a very similar fashion by first rolling out a thin layer of green stuff. I actually flipped the putty over after and used the side that had been in contact with my cutting board as it had created a little bit of a texture that worked pretty well for hammered steel. These were again attached using super glue and well, a whole lot of patience. Once I was happy with my sculpt, I again removed the template. This allowed me to continue some of the wood grain down onto the bottom of the slab and it made sure that as the green stuff cured, it didn't bond to the MDF. Once cured, I used my rotary tool to flatten out the little cylinder on the jewelry jumper. This is just a small little change that I think makes a big difference in making the jewelry piece look more believable as a miniature door handle. I cut off any excess putty from the slab and removed the door from the cutting board. I could then get to work making a form to pour in the silicone for the mold. This is incredibly easy to do. You simply need to cut a square of foam core a bit bigger than your master, and you can hot glue the master directly to that. Create walls using foam core and hot glue. Personally, I like to make my molds at least half an inch deep, even if the master is very thin. It honestly doesn't matter how pretty or square this form is, it just has to successfully hold the liquid silicone while it cures. Now for the silicone itself. I used Umu 25 by SmoothOn. It's a simple to use two part silicone that you mix in a one to one ratio and it cures really, really quickly. You'll notice I'm working from two fairly large buckets. Now, when I had the intention to create my dungeon door products in bulk, I bought large quantities of silicone and resin to get me started. I did this because both of those products get cheaper and cheaper as you purchase larger volume. Because I didn't end up proceeding with the product, this was actually a mistake and I don't recommend buying in large quantities. For one, it's really difficult to get small amounts for a project out of big buckets like this without wasting or making a mess. But more importantly, because this stuff has a very limited shelf life once open. Once it's opened, it starts to rapidly degrade. These buckets had been sitting on my shop shelf for several months since the last time I used them and one part has already started to get really thick. This makes it super difficult to mix and work with. And you'll have to forgive me for how ungracious the rest of this process became as a result of the one portion becoming thick and difficult to work with. The good news is that I later did some research and I can actually purchase some silicone thinner that will get this stuff back to a more workable consistency. If you're planning to try this out for yourself, I recommend buying a smaller volume to start. I mixed equal parts A and B and was left with a consistency that was far thicker than it should be, which again, made it harder to work with. When doing molding, you wanna to try to avoid bubbles on the surface of the piece. So it's a good idea to take an old brush and paint on some silicone to perfectly cover the master before pouring in the rest of the volume of silicone. When pouring, it's a good idea to do a high pour to create a thin ribbon of silicone. This will help get out a significant amount of the air that's in the mix and reduce bubbles. Unfortunately, because my mix was so much thicker than it should have been, it made doing this nearly impossible. Good news is for a simple one part mold, as long as you get good coverage on the master, it doesn't really matter if there are air bubbles in the rest of the mold. The only time that matters is when you get into using things like pressure pots for casting the resin, which if you're using that, you already know more than me and this information is irrelevant to you. 
When I mix and pour silicone, I always keep the mixing cup and stick. This way I can use it as a reference test to see when the silicone is fully cured and ready to remove from the form. You'll also notice that I didn't do anything to prevent dripping silicone on my work surface. That's because silicone by design doesn't stick to anything. That's the whole reason you use it to make molds so you can easily clean it off anything it contacts. Well, any hard surface, you don't wanna be getting it on cloth or clothing. Once cured, it's a simple matter of breaking off the form and removing the master, and you're left with a usable one-part silicone mold. Sometimes the silicone can get underneath your master and create a little flange of material on the mold. This can just be cut away. You can, if you wish, clean up the outside edges of the mold as well using a knife, but this has no actual effect on the mold and is really just a step to make yourself feel better. With a successful mold made, it's time to start casting. Of course, you can do this with a variety of materials. You can use plasters, which are far cheaper than resin, but the durability of the final piece is not gonna be as strong and you can't demold them nearly as quickly. For resin, I use Smooth On 320. It's a fast curing two-part resin that's simple to mix in a one-to-one -one ratio. You'll notice I do put down some paper for this as these drips are not easy to clean up and this process can get pretty messy. I used a scale here to mix equal parts, but when doing a lot of the same thing over and over again, you can work from marked cups once you know how much resin the mold is actually gonna hold. There's always a risk of resin sticking to your mold, so you wanna use some sort of mold release. I avoid using a spray lubricant as this will cause a lot of problems later when you get to painting. So I instead use baby powder. You just dust the mold and blow off the excess. Not only will this not add any difficult to paint material to the surface of the resin, the texture of the baby powder will actually transfer to the resin, giving it a matte finish instead of a glossy one, making it grab primer even better. When pouring in the resin, you again want to do a high pour to try to get a thin stream of resin, which releases any air from within the mixture. Bubbles are your enemy here. Once the mold is full, it can be helpful to vibrate the mold on the table a little bit to try to bring some of those air bubbles to the surface so that they're on the back of the finished piece that you won't later see. Then you can sit back and watch the magic happen. The cure time is gonna depend on your resin, but in my case, after 15 minutes, I can safely remove the casting from the mold. At this point, it's safe to demold it, but it isn't fully cured and is still a little bit flexible, so you wanna make sure you don't accidentally introduce any bend to your piece at this point, as that will be permanent once it fully hardens. You can create a ton of these in advance and even pre-prime the resin with an aerosol spray paint so that when you integrate them into builds using other materials like foam, they're already primed and ready to go. I highly recommend using a spray primer on resin as I found it has the best bond. These castings then paint up really nicely. Using green stuff to sculpt, I'm able to get a far more refined detail than I ever could with foam. But again, you can still get pretty good results with foam alone, as you've probably seen me do many times before if you're a longtime viewer. I hope that this video helps demystify the world of silicone molds and resin casting a bit and gives you the courage to try it for yourself if you've been considering it. I'll put some links in the video description to the products I used here. And remember, it's probably better to buy in smaller quantity, even though it's less cost effective by volume if you're just starting out. If you wanna pick up any other tools or supplies and help support the channel in the process, head over to blackmagiccraft.ca where I have my essential equipment page with affiliate links to all of the things that I use and recommend. Purchasing through those links helps fund these videos. These videos are a full-time effort to make happen every week, and it's made possible in large part due to the generous support of people on Patreon. 
If you get a lot of value out of these videos I make for the community and you want to help me keep making them, consider supporting Black Magic Craft on Patreon. I'd love to have you as the newest member of the Black Magic Craft Fellowship. That's it for this week, guys. I will see you again on Tuesday for Reviews Day. Cheers.